Hello, everyone. You're watching Mesha Choice Live Conversation. I'm Nezar Awi, founder and CEO of Mesha Choice, the New York-based company that empowers women on a daily basis. I'm here today with Jan Mercer Dams, our VP Development, and Dr. Risa Riger, our clinic, a clinical psychologist, member, and investor in Mesha Choice. Dr. Susan Steinbaum will be our guest speaker today, joining us later in the show. She is a renowned cardiologist, advocate, author, and public speaker. And our conversation today will be about change and our psychological resistance to it. Hello, Jan. Hi, everyone. Welcome. Happy Monday. So thrilled and excited to start the week with each and every one of you. We encourage you to send us your questions throughout the duration of the show, and we'll be doing a Q&A section at the end. Please, please, please visit us at Meisha, joinmeisha.com for content. We're an enterprise of brands for women by women desiring and delivering inspiring content and informational opportunities for you to stay actively engaged with each, each and every day. As you, many of you know, we hosted live events when we were all live together. And now that we're all things related to the digital world, we host over eight events every single week from workshops to our live streams such as this around themes as diverse as women and money, diversity, equity, inclusion, positive psychology, and the series that we host each and every Monday with Dr. Risa Riger helping us to set up the week for success. Thank you so much, Neza, and look forward to the show. Thank you. Dr. Riger, can you please explain to us the, the whole mystique behind the, the psychological resistance of change, especially in times where we all need to adapt to change? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Neza. And first, welcome everyone to our community in our sisterhood of Meshad. And as we're talking about as we're talking about change, one of the largest components and resistance to change is about fear. And we'll we'll get to that in just a, a couple of moments. But what happens with change is that we're used to doing something that we do because we've done it, so we do it and we continue to do it. And one of the things that happens is that with our brains, our brains love certainty. Let's start here. Our brains absolutely love certainty. And so when we have a situation, our brains love patterns. They, our brain sees something new. We perceive something and then we assess it and it's like click, 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 click. What is this? Do I know this? Is this familiar? Oh, yes, I know this one. And when I'm in this situation, this is what I do. And so what happens is that it is, it's a kind of a very effective and effortless way of, of being and way of living. Now, that doesn't mean that it's in our best interest, but it is what feels most, if for lack of a better word, natural. So that even when we're putting our foot into where there's a nail, there's something about the certainty about that, even though it's obviously not a good thing to do, where we go, oh, I'm so relieved. That nail is just where it was before. I I, I totally agree on what, what, what you're saying. And it's true that sometimes uh, we prefer staying in a, in a relationship to ourselves, to a situation, to, to someone that can be painful but uh, we, as you said, there is that certainty that gives us at least the comfort, not the pleasure, but the comfort of uh, recognizing it. And uh, change comes with the unknown. So uh, how, how do you explain as well our, our relationship to the unknown? Nessa, that is what an excellent question for this moment in time. Because one of the things that we're facing en masse, one of the things that we're facing globally is really dealing with an unknown and dealing with uncertainty. And that's a really, really hard place uh, for us to be. So I'll share with you, you know, on a, on a very simplistic basis. Um, I had my first daughter and, and 
And she turned, you know, thankfully we were, you know, so blessed that she was, you know, a healthy, healthy baby. And then I was pregnant with my second child. And all of a sudden I, you know, I was telling my mother and I was overcome with tears. And I'm like, I don't know what's going to happen, you know, and I got so worried of, you know, the first one was good, like, what's going to happen this time? And my mother had this incredible certainty and simplicity. And what she said to me was this, Risa, the first one was good. The second one will be good. And so how do we use that for ourselves? I mean, in terms of change. Change is not only what we have in our heads, but we have a physiological response to change because physiologically, Neza, we experience change as, as we experience change physiologically. We can feel our heart start to race. It is uncomfortable. It doesn't mean that it's bad. It just means it's uncomfortable. And so it's being able to identify over and over and over again and reassure ourselves over and over and over again with the level of self-awareness and tremendous self-compassion that what we're doing is okay and we're going to be okay. And um, I just want to share with you before I'm sure you have more to add to this, um, mm -hmm. an acronym that I found. I did not create this, but I did find this acronym of FEAR. Um, that FEAR is an acronym for false evidence appearing real. And so when we're in fear, we believe that, that this can happen. We're, we believe in our fearfulness. And that just because we think something doesn't mean it's real. Just because we think something doesn't mean it's going to happen. And at the moment, just like my mother reassured me, is our moment to help reassure ourselves that we have experienced, we've all experienced change. We've all experienced some change. And it's not necessarily easy. And it's certainly is not necessarily comfortable, but we've all experienced it. So if we can start foundationally saying, okay, this was a change and, and foundationally and actively and consciously, this was a change and I was okay. This was a change and that one didn't turn out so well, but I'm still okay. And that we start to develop our own internal credibility and our internal confidence that we will be able to tolerate this and we will be able to withstand it. And, and so begins change while we feel the uncomfortable feelings and manage our discomfort actively and begin to continue to reassure ourselves of our own well being. Risa, let's take this one step further even. Many of us understand what happens when we seek a new job and may experience change about changing, may experience frustration or anxiety or nervousness about changing jobs or getting married or buying a house or going through a divorce or those changes that more or less there is some sort of data that backs up his story around how those happen and what happens on the other side. We're in a whole different world right now where so much of it just isn't known, right? So as we're approaching everything from, you know, the millions and millions of people that have filed unemployment claims to changing natures of industries and how industries are going to have to really transform themselves to be able to come out to the other side, to just the impacts on the environment from a sustainability perspective. So coupled with what you just said, how do we navigate that even when there's much more uncertainty around what the future holds? We may have some level of comfort that we know what next month may hold. We may be able to go to the beach. We may not be able to go to the beach. But just as we think through even the next year, how do we, how do we muster the courage to be able to ease our anxieties and stresses and fears about that? The first thing to keep in mind, Jan, is that, you know what, we can't do it all at once. 
And as women who are, you know, as I, if we go back to the four Fs, we're the feelers, the fixers, the finders, and the freelancers, right? <laughs> and so we take, we take on a lot. And we can't take on all this change at once. And actually, nor do we have to. There's, and so this idea that we've got to just be all in on this is really an illusion and it is a disservice to ourselves because all we can do is begin to deal with, you know, one, what's in front of us and also acknowledge our uncertainty. Now, there's also a parsing out of what we have control over and what, in fact, we don't have control over. And really coming to grips with that. Now, as as New York women, regardless of where you came from originally, but if, you know, and for those women who are in other places, if you're here and watching, you're, you know, you're part of the pack, is that we're women who are used to having impact, you know, kind of rolling our sleeves up, being all in. And there are ways that we can do that but maybe not in the ways that we did it before. And so where we have impact and where we have control is in how we navigate and how we process the information in ourselves and how it is that we want to respond to it. Now, um, you know, one of the things I've talked about a little bit and um, is that, you know, if we think of this as a continuum, right? where on the one hand, we have avoidance, the center is steady, and on the other side is overwhelmed and paralysis. What we can do, and what is within our purview and in our control, is we can monitor ourselves. We can check in with ourselves authentically and courageously and be able to ask ourselves, okay, I'm, I'm in my check-in, where am I on this? And see about bringing ourselves back to steady, bringing ourselves back to steady best we can. There is no perfection. It doesn't exist. That's a conversation for another time. But that we work to bring ourselves back to steady best we can with tremendous self-compassion. And I'm not saying this in a woo-woo way. Self-compassion is crucial. It brings into play our acceptance of our own humanity and the humanity that we would extend almost to any other we need to bring to ourselves as well. So how we tolerate is that we acknowledge where we are, we acknowledge what our reactions are, we acknowledge what our reflex may be, and we work and try to bring ourselves back to steady because as we cultivate this space of steady we're also this is our this is our internal workout you know it's like this is our this is our emotional stamina and one of the things that we're building is emotional stamina Nessa, I was on one of your, I looked at one of your Instagrams and you were doing something workout. <laughs> you were doing some kind of workout. And I'm looking at this and I'm going, oh my God, this woman's got stamina. <laughs> but we don't get there all at once. Yeah. We don't get there all at once. Mm. And this is a time where we're building our emotional stamina, our stamina for tolerating uncertainty. And we do it. You know, we're not going to start by lifting a 20-pound barbell. Maybe we start with our own arms, right? And then we can start with one-pounders. There's no shame in a one-pounder. No shame. And we go and we go from there. But it doesn't happen all at once. Nothing gets built as at once, nor does our internal emotional tolerance and internal steadiness get built at once. Dr. Riger, I love the points that you said that once you don't do it all at the same time. And the second thing is in all changes today, but in, in general, there are the elements that you control and the ones that you don't control. And it's that fear of the uncontrolled that also stops us from 
um, uh, making changes in our life. And I think that what is happening today is, as you said, it's a great time to, to practice the change. And it takes by one week per week. And this is how we've all faced it. This is how we faced this time. Did we get locked down and said, okay, I know what I'm going to be doing for the next two months. No, you know, it, it, it was, okay, what am I doing this week? And then the following week and, and we've evolved in it and then we got used to it and then we started being productive in it. And that's the, the process in every change in our life. It's to understand that you cannot make that drastic change from a day to another. Whether you're trying to lose 20 pounds in your scale, it's not just going <laughs> to drop like this. Whether you're, you're trying to make a, a, a huge personal shift, a huge career shift, you, you just need to make it slowly. But you need to start making it because procrastinating on, on making it, it's not, it's not if you wait weeks or months before doing it, that it will be done faster. So my next question, Dr. Riger, is what happens when you're ready for change and then the other people in your life uh, are scared of your change? Whether you're deciding to change a job, career, or, or a look, or, or, you know, moving to a new country, and it starts shaking the ground of the, the other people that were with you. And even if you were in a position of discomfort and you know that you arrived at the end of the cycle and you want to enroll into a new cycle, but then there is the fear of others that are around you. That is such an important point, is that we are in relationship and we are affected by our relationships with others. And so when we become the unknown for them, there's an internal, for people, there can be really an internal kind of like a, a, a mini panic of who, who is she now? She doesn't, she's not saying what she usually said. Her hair looks different. She's not dating, you know, so-and-so anymore. And and so part of our expectation, I mean, we may think that we're going through this change and we are so happy, we're so proud of ourselves, we're so all that, right? And so we ex we have an expectation and a hope and a wish that the people around us are going, to, that's awesome. And that doesn't always happen, you know, mm -hmm. you know, for all sorts of reasons, because you have now become not you. I mean, you're still you, but you've also become not you mm -hmm. and people need to kind of you know and this is a, a point of um, how you want to deal with relationships you know uh, of being patient and not having an expectation of that and not having an expectation that you know that your change I mean and it depends look you know these things aren't black and white and there are people you know there are some people who are there for us when things are great. And there are some people who are there for us when things are awful. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it can be a challenge to, to find the people in our lives who are with us when things are great and when things are awful. Um, and so we, we are hoping that there are people who move with us as we move within ourselves and we want that attunement, you know, we've used, we've talked about attunement a little bit before with our kids, right? Of being attuned to their communication. But we also, we also as human beings, we want the people who we care about, the people around us to be attuned to us as well. And so, you know, maybe Neza, that's a kind of a divining point where you kind of, where we, we're such social beings and as women, we look for connection, we look for collaboration. And there may be just a point where we say, well, I'm just not getting that for now and make your own decisions about how you want to deal with that. And for other people, you know, you can have a conversation and say, yeah, you know, I, I know it's different and I know it's a change and I would love for you to, you know, when you can, as soon as you can, you know, kind of like be on board with me. And is there, you know, is there any way that I can help be of assistance with that? Because sometimes if you change, people experience that 
And they can have their own worry of like, well, who is she now? Is she still going to love me? Is she still going to care about me now that she's become different in this way? Am I just like, it seems like there's a piece of her that got left behind or that shifted. Am I part of that shift? And am I no longer part of the picture? And so that can be a point of, of social reassurance. Lisa, it's fascinating what you're saying because I, I think that also we're seeing this moment in time, going back to something you said earlier around women feeling the need to take it all on for themselves and to create the change for themselves and everyone else around them too, right? Because that's what we do naturally as, as nurturers and caretakers. And it was interesting, we did a, a Mayshad membership brain trust call this morning with a group of our members. And one woman who's incredibly accomplished, runs a global technology company, said, I'm so happy to be able to have this tribe of women to speak with because I often feel very much alone in my own thoughts, particularly right now, right? And I'm sure that for many of us as corporate executives, as business owners, as entrepreneurs, as women in transition, we don't necessarily have the tribe that we feel like that has our back to be able to support us during this time. And so to your point, Risa, around how we want to create opportunities to show that the people that we really truly care about and love and adore feel that they're a part of the journey with us. But then do you also see this as a moment in time where we're taking a step back and reflecting upon who we really want to have in our tribes? Not in this time as an assessment of what energy do we really want to have around with us psychologically? Absolutely, Jan. It, that's a really clear answer. Um, <laughs> is that, uh, you know, absolutely. And and by the way, I, I, I'm going to start uh, af- going beyond absolutely. What I what I want to be clear about because is that we have a we have a right to assess our relationships. We have a right to make a d- determination to think about and not in a not in a disrespectful way but in a respectful way for ourselves, is come to reflect on what do our relationships look like? You know, certainly with um, sheltering at home, and that we have time to think about this, or we have, you know, in some respects, it's very strange. We have kind of limited time. And, um, and then we get to decide, you know, who do we want to share time with? When we're on FaceTime with people, when we're on screens, that requires a lot of effort and energy. It truly does. And so it brings into focus, I think, in a different kind of way that is the person that I'm on a Zoom call with, is the person I'm on a FaceTime call with, is that someone that I really want to share my time with and share my thoughts with? And you have a you have a right it's okay to rethink relationships and to think about well this is where i am and and you know what am i what am i looking for where is reciprocity and is this a is this a reciprocal relationship where the you know reciprocity you know as women we're not like one one for one you know i i I gave you a bite of my brownie. Now you have to give me a bite of your ice cream, right? We don't have to be on a one-one that way. But we do have to have, you know, some sort of internal balance of what feels worthwhile to us, what feels like it's 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 a relationship that we want to be in. And so it's it's a time to that we can assess that for ourselves and rethink, you know, how much am I giving? What am I giving? What am I looking for? Um, how am I being supported? Is this someone who, after I get off a call with them, do I need to, does it feel like I'm kind of reconstructing myself or, you know, that I need to recover in some way for the, you know, from the call? And not on one time, you know, we're, but that's not who we are. Um, not on one time, but that we really take into account the you know how important you know what we give is and that that what we give has value and that we have value and so we you know what does this relationship look like and is this a relationship that I'm going to invest you know kind of my my heart and soul into this relationship or does it does it move in a different kind of way and I change my thinking and my energy level about this relationship Thank you, Dr. Riger. Uh, yes, 
good time to reevaluate relationships and uh, life uh, is giving us that opportunity now and that time. And um, to, to your point, Jan and Dr. Riger, on in, in, in our biggest innovative solutions and decisions in times, we, we often make them out of our inner circles of same industry or same community or same, because when you're involving into um, a similar community, I'm not talking about being with similar values, which is what we're offering with Meshad, but a diversity of, of everyone has their own story, their own experience. So when you're evolving in a sort of like tribe that is just too similar to each other and we kind of like find a comfort uh, at the beginning to being with people that are just from our industry or so on, then we just stop our um, chains of change and innovation. And uh, someone who is far away from you and from your close uh, tribe will actually support you even more into that change. And then within your own community, you will find those supportive elements, but they're usually people who went through change themselves. And so once one accepts and succeed the, the, the transition of change, because I think that change is positive. Actually, the world is constantly in movement and constantly changing. When you look at a plant and, and you put a camera in front of it, like a time lapse over months, you will see it growing and changing. And, and so we, we tend to not see that change happening around us. And that's how we feel that something is different, but we don't know what it is. And, and we don't want to adapt to the new thing. And everything changes. And we have, we must, we must not only to survive, but to, to, to thrive, we must be those human beings that are progressive, that are constantly in that humility to listen what the world is demanding, what the world is becoming, and, and who are they in this world. So Dr. Susan Steinbaum has just joined us uh, to present Dr. Steinbaum again. Um, she is a renowned cardiologist, advocate, uh, writer, uh, a public speaker. Susan, can you tell us a little bit, first of all, how you have been coping with all this change and, and what is your philosophy on change? I think that change is part of life and that change is really something that's great in some ways and something that we need to embrace. I think a couple of, um, I'm listening to you, listening to this idea of emotional stamina, I always say resilience is the key to everything. And where I sit, it's it's from a place of health and wellness and sickness. And there's nothing that changes a person or a family or relationships more than when someone gets sick. So when we look at this concept of change, it, the potential for it exists every single day in our lives. In a million years, none of us could have predicted this. Yet here we are and how we cope with the little changes on a daily basis is how we're really ultimately coping with this in small bites, as you say, recent in small bites. But I, what, from what I see, um, it's all about fear and there's so much unknown right now for all of us. And unless we have a real understanding that fear is based on the unknown, that we kind of have to just get control over what we can. And from my perspective, it's all about this health piece, you know, getting up and exercising and eating well and sleeping and the fundamentals and foundation of what we really need to do to take care of ourselves becomes an easier way to change because you actually feel better. But I think what happens is Mentally, we get sort of unbalanced and then emotionally, we have anxiety, depression, this fear takes a hold of us 
and then our behaviors change. And when our behaviors change, we eat too much, we don't sleep, we drink too much, we smoke, we don't talk to people, we over talk to people. I mean, it's the extremes of behavior. And ultimately what happens is that imbalance in my mind leads to some sort of sickness. So if there wasn't a, a better time to find out how to manage change. I mean, I, I feel like we can go from nursery school of learning how to change to graduate school of learning how to manage change all during this time because we have no choice. And, and I believe that if we can identify our fears, no matter what it is and how we're changing, if we can really target what they are and figure out how to control exactly what we can and let go of what we can't, we're going to do ourselves a big favor. Suzanne, you, you talk often about the integrative nature of a body from a holistic perspective and heart health as it then implies and affects so much else as we think about the physical totality of our, of, our, of our own bodies. And you and I have talked a bit about just the fact that there's, from a medical perspective, there's so much attention spent now on, on COVID-19 and we're adopting and changing to be able to be responsive to that from a healthcare perspective. But then there's a lot that may not be necessarily treated on an ongoing basis now. So people with chronic conditions and people that are navigating through different moments of change in their life. Talk to us a bit about how you see that playing out both now and then as we move beyond COVID-19 as well. One of the things that we're seeing is really people with chronic issues having worse outcomes. And so when we tease apart on a daily basis what we're learning about this disease, I think the one take, well, there are a couple of take homes, one of them being, of course, to protect ourselves and really to understand that ultimately this is in our control, what we can do to protect ourselves as we're watching the world and the medical and scientific communities trying to figure it out on their own. Um, but what we're hearing is real, wearing a mask, washing your hands, six feet distancing. The world is gonna open up. And as the world opens up, this is still gonna be here. So we're all gonna have to figure out how to take care of ourselves through this process. But from one part of it, we're understanding these underlying chronic diseases certainly lead to worse outcomes. So again, if this isn't a moment to take a self-care inventory, you know, what am I not doing for myself that really can help me live a healthier life? Now's the time be brutally honest with yourself. Um, and what does that mean? Are you eating well? Are you sleeping enough? Are you drinking too much? Are you drinking too much coffee? You know, what's your vice? Now's the time, you know, really to confront how to, how to take care of yourself. But I think the other piece of this is, is this component of fear and change and this notion of stress and how this mind-body connection really comes down to what we call this fight or flight response. This how I think then releases a whole host of hormones, epinephrine, norepinephrine, cortisol. What this does is increase our heart rates, our blood pressures. I always refer to it as back in the taxi when you're late for a meeting and there's tons of traffic syndrome. <gasps> I think we've all experienced that. And what that is, is really this rush of epinephrine and norepinephrine increasing your heart rate and increasing your respiratory rate and your blood pressure. And then the sequence goes on and there's an increase of inflammation. And we're certainly hearing a lot about inflammation with COVID-19 as well. This response for us is not good. So how do we manage this? We really have to work on how we think, how we perceive all of this. You've talked about social support. Who are the people surrounding you? We talk about a lot of time being, being mindful, meditating, having gratitude, being optimistic. All of these mechanisms that we incorporate in our lives on a daily basis that's about 
emotional stamina. That's what resiliency is about. And that's really about how we cut off the brain to the heart, this fight or flight syndrome from really having an effect on us physically. Suzanne, let's also talk a bit about this through a gendered lens as well and the, the work that you do as the, the spokesperson for Go, Go Red for Women in the National American Heart Association. You're very passionate about all things related to women's heart health. And we know that heart disease and um, you know just overall heart health as it impacts the rest of the body too, affects women very differently. And the work that you're doing now with your patients, do you see in this particular moment in time as we're all experiencing change and taking proactive steps in it, is that a different experience for women than for men? What's interesting is that we know that women who are under stress and have less sleep, less restorative sleep, are more prone than men to things like depression and anxiety, um, feeling overwhelmed and fatigued and perseverating and laying awake at night and not getting enough sleep. And what we do understand is that with this process, this increased amount of stress, that actually women do worse. Through the whole process of this disease, we're seeing a difference in men or, and women. But separate from that, being in this moment with this change, this resiliency and this ability to actually separate the stress from the physical, women are not as great at that as men are. And that this stress tends to affect us and affect our hearts and affect us physically more than men. I've spent so many years talking about the effect of stress and anxiety and depression on the heart because there is such a profound impact on depression and heart disease, and such a, a profound impact on anxiety and heart disease specific to women, that what we're talking about today, this concept of change, this concept of fear, we have to understand this is a little bit more than just us feeling okay and feeling like we can do it. I feel like this is really um, the basis of health for life. Because life, no matter what, is never easy. It's always changing. I think that's a given. And so how we manage it really affects how we age physically and how we, we really grow old. You know, what happens with us as we age and we go through menopause and we grow through life, our, our propensity to have heart disease goes up and chronic diseases goes up. So the more that we can manage, the more that we can handle that comes at us, the less chance for chronic disease, the less chance of getting sick. I keep saying to my patients, our number one job is not to get sick. That is our number one job right now. And that is not just about how we take care of ourselves, but it also is how we mentally manage all of this change and all of this fear that's going on. Thank you, Suzanne. Risa, a question for you too, and in, in the same vein as well. Are you seeing some gender differences in the sense of how your clients and patients are, are internalizing and ad adopting to change as well? Absolutely. And I also want to, Suzanne, you know, I just wanted to go back and, and you know, comment on what you were saying, which I think is just so important because, you know, way back when there was the illusion that women did not, women were immune from heart disease. Women did not have heart disease. And that was kind of a basic assumption. And now things are looking very, very different. And as we understand more, and I'm, you know, and part of the, part of a gender difference is when, you know, when you talk to a woman about, well, you know, you need to exercise and you need to eat better and you need to sleep well, that, that, that if that if that if that was the prescription, not that they're going to comply, but if that was the prescription given to men, that would be like, well, that's you know that's what you should be doing. But when women talk about, well, I should exercise more, and you know, I, I'm going to exercise more, I'm going to eat better, I'm going to take better care of myself, that that comes under you know that uh, this confusion between self care and self indulgence. 
that it's 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 an an indulgence. It's like you know, well, you're you're you know, isn't it great that you have time to exercise? Isn't it great that you have time to sleep? Um, isn't it great that you're you know have time to eat food that isn't going that is actually good for you, and that it it is it is fundamentally about health. It's just fundamentally about health. And to your point, I mean, way back when in my graduate work, I did research on women and depression. And one of the one of the key results was that the women's social network served a a crucial component for them to help them with with depression and to help them, you know, kind of not have the most severe experiences of depression. And so it's in connection that um, that we experience health, that we can support each other, that we can be proponents of uh, self-care and that self-care and wellness is not the same as self-indulgence. And, you know, and so how are women and men responding differently, Jan, you were asking about that? Well, what we do know is that when women are at home, and I, and I don't have I don't have the stats. I'm sure you know uh, we have very very competent, capable women who can you know find the find the stats at this. But when women are home, and even if there's you know there are two parents in the home, oftentimes that it's the woman who's not only taking on her you know continuing with her work, but also. A, a disproportionate amount of what needs to ha- what needs to happen in the household, and so the the way that women are are coping, you know, is is different because their load is different. Their load is different. The expectations are different. You know, after you're you know dealing with your job and been on conference calls all day. And then you're, you know, making dinner and then you're, you're the one who realizes that the kitchen floor is too disgusting to stay that way for another day. Um, you know, it may be that you're the one taking out the mop or getting the rag and like just getting on the floor and, uh, and cleaning things up so that it, it's also a time of reevaluating and rethinking what are our roles? How does how do these responsibilities get divided and again things don't have to be 50 50 but who's doing what and what are the what are the expectations and so that becomes another way of women taking care of themselves and part of of wellness is there's only so much that i can there's only so much that i can do and take on in addition to making sure that I'm going to get a food delivery so that there's going to be enough food to be able to actually have a meal and not wind up with, you know, um, crackers and scraps of something or other and a, and a can of soup. I mean, there's a lot of, there's, it's, it's hard now. And so how, how are things getting, how, how are responsibilities and expectations getting, um, getting distributed? Well, and follow up, I think that's a really interesting point, Risa, and to, to you and to, to Suzanne as well. I'm wondering then if that helps to perpetuate our inability to get out of our own way as it pertains to change. Because if we get constantly trapped up and those trappings are reified time and time and time again, where we're not able to think through to understand the forest through the trees in the sense of how do we get out of our own way so that we can be open to creating more opportunities for change. Because if we stay in the day-to-day routine in the weeds, then we're not able to see the, the sense of the possibility and the sense of really needing to embrace and adopt change. And then how does that pertain to our overall emotional and physical health as well as women? Suzanne, I'll let you comment to that. We'll go back to Risa. <laughs> Suzanne, your your mute's on. So sorry. <laughs> a little bit of a connection issue with you. You were coming in and out during your question. Um, but from what I hear that you said, and correct me if I'm wrong, just the amount that women are dealing with and negotiating 
um, now that they're home, I'm going to tell you that through the American Heart Association and Go Red for Women, a lot of the statistics that we look at really are looking at women in the workforce and how much they're also taking care of home. So I don't think this is new at all. Um, I think this has been part of the issue. I, it was in 1984 that women entered the workforce equally as much as men. And I always joke around because this isn't exactly true, but that was the year that women and men had equal amounts of heart disease. Obviously, you know, it's like we're now doing everything. We're in the workforce, we were working at home, and now we have heart disease. We got their, their disease as well. That's not really why. There was no um, research really done on women's hearts for the 20 years prior to that time. And it really caught up with us. And that's why women started dying of heart disease more than men in 1984. But what we have seen is no different from that time moving forward. It wasn't like women entered the workforce and there was an equal distribution of home duties with the men. That's never really been the case. And I think that's part of the amount of stress and responsibility. And, and this time, I'm not kidding, part of really um, the reason that women do have such heart disease, that juggling act is impossible. Recent statistics have shown women less than 55 years old having an increased incidence of heart attacks and strokes. Now, when we really look at the reasons why, and we tease through this data, it's because these women are less healthy. There's a greater incidence of being overweight, having diabetes, metabolic syndrome. There's an increased incidence of high cholesterol and high blood pressure. Well, I think we can all agree probably why that is. You know, I appreciate so much this notion, um, Risa, that, that this is about self-care is, is a luxury or it's overindulgence. And all I'm going to say to everyone is it's something that needs to go in your schedule. You have a meeting planned. You have your schedule for the day. You have your one hour for you where you get to exercise. Because if you don't take care of yourself, and I look at these statistics and I meet these women and they're patients of mine, I will tell you that the reality is without us taking care of ourselves, we will get sick. Because the truth of the matter is we are all juggling so much all the time. And it does catch up. It's really hard. And going back to See, Nessa, I don't think that I'm, I'm pointing this way because on my screen, this is where, <laughs> um, you know, you were, you were talking about, you know, how do we deal with our own changes and people around us being able to deal with that change and, um, and work with us, uh, uh, you know, and, and understand what it is. And so this can also be a really not an easy time, but a good time to start to reestablish normative expectations. Who does what? Who's responsible? How do we work together? How do we distribute? What happens when one person is just, you know, busier than the other? Can the other person just kind of like take on more? And, and, and even with our children, you know, uh, with our children, I mean, some of us have gotten used to having help in our home. And so there are things that no one ever did. And now somebody has to do. And so, you know, who does what? What are expectations? And so it really, you know, to your point, Susan, it gives us an opportunity to reshuffle the deck and have a, and have a conversation as a family, you know, regardless of what your family constellation is, of, of what we expect from one another and where we have to make adjustments in our expectations and who needs to, you know, who needs to step up. I've, I've been talking to a lot of working mothers who are now homeschooling. Who knew that was going to happen? <laughs> And the balance of working and making sure your children are now learning 
and taking care of the rest of it has really been daunting for a lot of women. And what I'm going to say personally and what I say to them professionally is nothing is perfect all the time. And we really need to give ourselves a break and do the best that we can. Do I think the luxury is to have both of you today on this show and having an amazing perspective on change on the psychological level and on the heart level and understanding the impact that stress has on our hearts. And uh, yes, when we're not when we're not adapting to change, we are hurting ourselves. And uh, and when people are not letting us change, and when that change is positive, they are hurting us. And that is not love, because like a lot of people will say yes, but you know I don't want this for you because I love you. And and love is is also something that is mistaken on on that level. Um, when when people are not comfortable in a situation, change cannot be a negative thing. Even if they had to test something and come back to where they were, then then they tested, you know, and they came back not exactly how they were. They would come back with a change to to whether it is a relationship or or a situation. So. We're going to go now to the questions from our audience that is watching us. And uh, the first question is, people who feel overwhelmed can go with the flow, which doesn't necessarily translate to motivation. How do you not mistake compliance for acceptance? Who wants to answer first? Dr. Riger, would you like to take on this question? Could you repeat the question, please? I want to make sure I've got this. Yes. People who feel overwhelmed can go with the flow, which doesn't necessarily translate to motivation. So how do you not mistake compliance for acceptance? Like feeling that, that you know, someone is making a change, but they're not just, they're not making a change. They're actually not, they're just like going with the flow and not really facing the reality of, of the situation. That's really a very interesting question that I haven't uh, thought about. So it's it's uh, it's it's great to think about this. Now, sometimes what can happen is that that even if you're going with the flow and you're not committed to a change, right? I mean, you never know how change is going to happen, and so it may be that by starting to do something different, even if, it, even if it's starting as compliance. I mean, look, Suzanne, I'm sure that lots of patients that you're working with, that they're, they may not be motivated or they're just being compliant, you know, it, and, and sometimes we take compliance. Compliance as a first step is really okay. And we'll take compliance versus nothing. And so sometimes what can happen is through doing and through making a shift and through practicing something new and different, you can you can become aware or learn or experience some sort of benefit of of doing that, and um, and so it can become a motivator and an igniter for change inadvertently. And one thing I just want to share and. Um, is that there's something I don't know if you if you all have heard about this there because we have a lot of a life administrative work you know life administrative kinds of uh, things that we need to do, and in Australia they created something called I, and I'm I'm not sure I'm pronouncing it correctly either um, Gilio or Gilio practices which is get your life in order, okay, and that. What happens is that when we don't get our lives in, when we don't get our lives in order, that we have attention residue. It's like, oh my gosh, I still need to do this. Oh my gosh, I still need to do that. And that one of the changes that we can make, right, that either motivational or inspirational, is to set aside time to say, okay, I'm going to take care of this then, and now I'm going to take the bath. Sit down and chew, and sit down with my food and actually chew it. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to shove it in my, you know, and that 
you've put things away so that you can have a clear mind to do what you're to do what you're doing and then to be able to really relax in knowing that you have a place to put this other stuff that you need to take care of so we don't know how change can happen but if somebody's willing to make a change even if it's compliance initially who knows where that could lead Suzanne? in my, in yeah. my world we call it behavioral modification how do we change behavior for the better and this has been a subject of debate and research forever and ever and ever but one of the things i can tell you is that positive reinforcement and positive feedback, and I know this research was done with children in schools, if you, if you reward a child, they tend to do better than if you actually criticize them. And so sometimes going with the flow will lead you to a place where you actually get some positive feedback. And that's the beginning of change. And if there's enough positive feedback, which you hope for, that's when commitment happens. So if you're watching somebody from the sidelines who, who is really doing this, cheer them on, give them encouragement and help them commit by finding what is their best qualities. What are they doing that's successful? What do they, what do they have within themselves that can change where they are and take them to someplace new where all of their great qualities can be utilized to the maximum. And that's where success is going to be. And that behavioral modification really is, is the key piece between going with the flow and commitment and actually success. Thank you both. So our next question is linked to, to uh, COVID-19 and what during this time should we not change? when we are faced to a mass change of the uncertainty, what is it that we should not change now? Dr. Riger, would you like to start? Sure. Uh, what we should not change. We should not change our compassion for one another. We should not change our opportunities where sometimes it's the hardest and um, to when you're feeling frustrated or you're feeling stretched with, something going on at, at, at home or people getting, you know, frustrated that at those times, at those moments, and, and I don't mean that this to sound kind of out there, but in all seriousness, if you can bring more love, that to think about bringing, bringing more love, that's one thing that you can do. Have more patience with others that maintaining your patience, maintaining your, your care for yourself, maintaining connection with others, maintaining your relationships, giving love, letting people know that you care, letting people know that you care about them, that you're thinking of them, uh, that it is what not to change, not to change your humanity, no matter what. Dr. Steinbaum. That was beautiful. I, <laughs> you know, I, I, and, and I agree with that. I think that this is the time where we actually reach out to each other. We might not be next to each other, but it's really about reaching out to each other. I think that one of the, and again, I'm going to come back to the health place, um, is really to not change this piece of us you know, th this isn't the time to start baking banana bread every day and eating it like we did for only the first week. I think that like <laughs> half of, I found out half of America was doing this as well. I thought that was very strange. I thought it was just us, but you know, it's really not the time to get off a schedule. I think this is the time when you have to lock down a schedule and that schedule of I'm going to go to bed on time. I'm going to wake up on time. I'm going to eat healthy, find a time to exercise. This is the time to figure out how to put it in your schedule. And there's one thing I want to bring up. One of the studies that I have found so fascinating is this concept of having a purpose in life and how having a purpose in life actually improves our outcomes in terms of our life expectancy and living without disease. 
And if there is no better time to remind yourself who you are, why you're here, what you're passionate about, where you want to go, what is your purpose in life? And really live through that and understand that that's why you're here. And we might be taking a small pause, but don't give up that concept. Because I truly believe that if you honestly feel like you are here for a reason, and this is this part of you, and a little bit of optimism sprinkled in there, a little bit of the glass half full and not half empty, it's really gonna get us through this to the other side. And those pieces, I would hope that you don't change now, but that you can hold on to that forever. Thank you both. Thank you, Jan. And thank you for, for th these are such beautiful thoughts to, to today's conversation. Um, we were on May Chat Choice live conversation and we will be back next Monday. You can find us on our May Chat Choice uh, uh, YouTube channel and on Join May Chat all the time. Jan, do you have anything to add to this? Thank you so much to you both. It's, and Suzanne, we would love to have you come back as well because it's, and even talk more about the, the interrelatedness of the, the body, mind, spirit as it pertains to women's heart health as well. It's such interesting moments and times that we're all going through together. And so it's great to be a part of this ecosystem and bring incredible women like yourself to be able to share wisdom and thoughts and knowledge for how we live now and then how we create the future together. Everyone, please, as Neza said, visit us at joinmeshad.com. And if you're interested in learning more about membership opportunities and how you can participate in many of our conversations, please, please, please reach out to us. Thank you so much, everyone. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you.